हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर हिदायतुल्ला फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोफिजिक्स ऑल इंडिया इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मेडिकल साइंसेस टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट ए मॉडल स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ प्रोटीन लाइक एंड कॉम्प्लेक्सेस अंडर पेपर बायोमोलिकल्स एंड देयर इंट्रैक्शंस दिस मॉडल विल डिस्कस अबाउट नॉलेज गेन फ्रॉम स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ प्रोटीन लाइक एंड कॉम्प्लेक्सेस लाइक मोड ऑफ लाइक एंड इंट्रैक्शंस स्पेसिफिसिटी ऑफ लाइक एंड and the protein recognition for specific ligands or substrates for example enzyme drug complex transporter co carbohydrate complex atp binding protein complex receptor ligand receptor drug complex enzyme antibiotic complex and their resistant mechanism all the fundamental cellular process is mediated by a array of biological signals these biological signals are mediated by ligands such as nucleotides like adenine triphosphate atp guanine triphosphate or gtp or amino acids like glutamine uh, leucine which are important in glutamine transporter leucine transporter ions like sodium potassium we have channels like sodium channels potassium channels chlorine channels then carbohydrates like maltose transporter glucose transporter sucrose transporter etc there are also small molecules which are important for mediating the ligand interactions so how do we define ligand a ligand can be defined as a molecule which can trigger a conformational change in a protein or any other macromolecule which lead to a array of biological signals importance of protein ligand complexes complex arrays of intramolecular interactions depends on the binding site of the macromolecules it is also depends on the interacting ligands so the knowledge we gained from the structure of protein ligand complexes or mode of binding of ligand solvent around the binding site or active site the mechanism of enzyme activity or protein function flexibility of protein binding site optimization of drugs to develop new compounds enzyme drug complex so here we see example for phospholipase a2 complex with non steroidal anti inflammatory agent aspirin so phospholipase a2 it is an erythrolytic enzyme binds to the glycerophospholipids and hydrolyzes the lipid to liberate pro inflammatory substrates like arachidonic acids which leads to the inflammations these arachidonic acids are further processed by the inflammatory pathway enzymes and release they produce a substrates called prostaglandins which are called as eicosanoids these eicosanoids are the ones which cause a physiological effect on the disease like arthritic rheumatoid and asthma so there are people who are working researchers working on these enzymes to design drug against this one against this enzymatic pathway so acetyl salicylic acid aspirin a well known drug often used to treat pain and inflammation this acetyl salicylic aspirin it is extracted from the willow tree before we know about the pharmacological effect of this drug this aspirin has been previously used against this inflammatory pathway enzymes enzyme drug complex with pla2 with substrate pla2 specifically cleaves phospholipids at sn2 position so lipid binds at the hydrophobic channel so in this figure you see the pla2 along with the lipid the lipid is shown in sticks in green color the active site amino acids histidine aspartic acid and tyrosine are shown and you also see that the lipids interacts with the aspartic acid and histidine that's how the catalytic reaction happens on the right side you see a surface representation of the lipid and the pla2 so the lipid binds in the hydrophobic cavity of the pla2 so any inhibitor or ligand design should basically block the active site or the hydrophobic channel to prevent the catalytic reaction or the binding of the substrate here we see enzyme drug complex with the pill uh, aspirin 
the anti inflammatory agent aspirin binds to the active site of the PL2 by forming water mediated interaction with the catalytic amino acids histidine 48 aspartic acid 49 and calcium ion here we see the cartoon representation where the aspirin is shown in sticks in cyan color the calcium ion is shown in blue color and the active site amino acids are shown like histidine 48 aspartic acid 49 so you see that aspirin is interacting with the catalytic amino acid through a water mediated interactions and it forms a direct interaction with the catalytic calcium ion on the right side you see a surface representation where aspirin is completely buried inside the active site channel so it is buried inside that's how it inhibits but does not completely inhibits because it's not covering the whole substrate binding channel so aspirin takes place takes over the place of oh group of lipids as you seen in the substrate complex but it does not block the complete hydrophobic channel so there is a scope for improving the inhibitors in this from this uh, in this complex we can understand that there is a scope to improve the inhibitor complex so as we see from the model we understood that how the pl2 drug complex was been made with non steroid anti inflammatory drug aspirin so to design more specific inhibitor for phospholipase a2 we need to block the hydrophobic substrate binding channel so to block the hydrophobic substrate binding channel you need to design inhibitor which is should be long hydrophobic and it should also interact with the catalytic amino acids so from the example of aspirin we know that the inhibitor should have a oh group that might be a ideal candidate to form interaction with either water mediated or direct interaction with the active site amino acids like histidine 48 aspartic acid 49 of pl2 in short the inhibitor should have a hydrophobic group so that it can block the hydrophobic channel as well as the active carboxyl group or an oh group so that it can directly interact with the active site amino acids like histidine 48 and 49 so transporter carbohydrate complex so glucose is an essential fluid for all biological organisms in human there are about 14 types of essential glucose transporter called as glutes so all these glutes they belong to slc family that means solute carrier type transporters there are almost 14 types in this 14 types glute 1 to glute 4 are the most essentially studied transporters so far glute 1 transporter is responsible for transporting the glucose across the blood barrier blood tissue whereas glute 2 transporter is responsible for transporting glucose across kidney intestine and other organisms in liver such as glute 3 transporter is mainly responsible for transporting glucose across the brain for uh, giving glucose to the neurons so each type of glute glute transporter has a specific function at a specific site in body so mutation in this glute glucose transporter like glutes leads to some diseases like glute 1 deficiency syndrome when there is a mutation in glute 1 transporter type 2 diabetes mellitus which is in mutation in the glute 2 transporter and when there is a mutation in the glute 3 transporter then you have alzheimer disease etc so in this module we will be discussing about the structure of complex of glute 3 transporter in complex with alpha d glucose glute 3 transporter with beta d glucose glute 3 transporter with maltose which is also an exophageal inhibitor and we'll see how the structure explains the substrate specificity for this sugar and the selectivity by the glutes transporter carbohydrate complex glutes 3 glucose transporter glute 3 glucose transporter facilitate diffusion of glucose and it is responsible for glucose supply to the brain and other organs the structure shown here is a glute 3 transporter consist of a canonical major facilitator superfamily fold with n and c domain 
enclosing a cavity that opens towards the extracellular or outward open conformation. What I mean by extracellular or outward open conformation? The figure on the right side, what you see is a GLUT3 transporter. So you see N terminal domain in violet color. It consists of six alpha helical domain. On the right side, you see yellow color, six alpha helical domain, which is a C domain. So this, the, at the center, you see a small ball and stick, which is a glucose. So the glucose is bind at the center of the alpha helical domain, N terminal domain and the C terminal domain. So when the glucose is at the cytoplasm, it gets transported into the periplasm through this transporter. So now you see that GLUT3 is open towards a periplasm. So when it is open towards the periplasm, we call that as an outward open conformation. If it is open towards the cytoplasm, we will call this inward open conformation. Here we see that GLUT3 transporter complex showing that glu how GLUTs bind to A or beta anomers of D glucose. That means alpha D glucose or beta D glucose. In the left hand side you see two figures. right? Here in that one we see that alpha beta glucose bound in a, which is shown in violet color. So you see that the tryptophan recognizes the OH group on the left side. On the right side, you see same beta D glucose where tryptophan also recognizes the sugar. The difference between the alpha beta alpha D glucose and beta D glucose on, is shown on the right side. So where you have stereo projection, right? In this one, you see in alpha D glucose the OH group is pointing downwards, whereas in beta D glucose the OH group is pointing upwards. So now come back to this figure on the left side. So here in the violet color, you see that the OH group is pointing downwards, which is alpha D glucose and it has been recognized by the tryptophan. On the right side, which is in the glucose in the gray color, you see that OH group is pointing downwards. So that is how this GLUT3 transporter recognizes this both anomers of D glucose. That means it can recognize both alpha D glucose also and beta D glucose also. That means it can transport both type of glucose into the cell. Based on the knowledge of structure complex, the researchers try to study different sugars with both A or beta anomers. So can the GLUT3 can recognize other sugars also? So they have done extensive study with different types of sugars which are shown on the left side of your figure. So you see D-glucose, L-glucose, D-fructose, D-galactose, L-galactose like that. So the sugar which are marked in with a box are having a very good transport by the GLUT3 transporter when they did their periplasmic based transport assay. Whereas the, the glucose which are shown in bold like L-arabinose, l lys Lyos are showing a slightly inhibitor effect on these GLUT3 transporters. So this observation is very complicated. So the important thing is that how is it able to recognize OH group? In one complex they are able to recognize the OH group. In certain complexes when they, when they did the biochemical transport assay you see the inhibitor effect. So the important observation from the complex is that in general the aromatic residues in the active site are considered to be involved in stacking interaction whereas the structure complex of GLUT3 with the glucose showed that the tryptophan which is an aromatic amino acid tryptophan 386 is involved in recognition of alpha beta form of sugars. So as we see in the previous slide that they tried different types of sugars to see how it can transport the sugar across the membrane. So they were puzzled by the different sugar showing different specificity and disposed transport mechanism. So the researchers went on to make a complex of disaccharide which is a maltose. Maltose is also considered as an exofacial competitor for D glucose. So it is a longer sugar like disaccharide. So it is a dimer of glucose. It also binds to these glutes 
but the transport is not as efficient as compared to deglucose. So they made the complex of GLUT3 transporter with the maltose sugar and the structure shown here in the cartoon representation is shown the glucose transporter, GLUT3 transporter with the maltose and it is also an outward open conformation. It is open towards the periplasm. So the maltose is shown in sphere at the center of this domain. Okay. So on the right side you see two figures where one you see the interaction of maltose which is shown in cyan. So here also the tryptophan is recognizing the sugar which is the alpha D glucose and it is also you see that the disaccharide is very longer. On the right side you see the superimpose of D glucose complex and the maltose complex. So here you see critically two difference. The one in the green color belongs to that of complex of GLUT3 com complex with uh, maltose sugar and which is on shown on yellow is the complex of GLUT3 with uh, glucose. So here you see that particularly the amino acid which is shown in the arrow is asparagine. In case of D glucose, the asparagine is moving towards the glucose and it is interacting. This belongs to a transmembrane helix. This asparagine belongs to a transmembrane helix. When glucose is there, then the transmembrane helix can move. Whereas when the maltose is there, you see that asparagine is moving away. It is shifted away. So the transmembrane helix cannot move. It is basically the another disaccharide is blocking the movement of the transmembrane helix. So as a result, there is a slow transport and it's, it's also an, we can also call it as an inhibitor. So we saw example for GLUT3 transporter with alpha beta glucose, alpha beta D glucose and beta D glucose and maltose, trans, maltose complex with the GLUT3 transporter. So the knowledge we obtain from the GLUT complexes is that the GLUT3 complex reveals that the GLUT can recognize both anomers. That means beta D glucose also it can recognize, alpha D glucose also it can recognize. Hence anomerization may not be required for the D glucose transported by glutes. Either it can glute 1 to glute 4 or glute 12. So anomerization is not required. It can recognize beta D glucose also, alpha D glucose also. Whereas when you have a longer disaccharides like maltose, xylose or other uh, disaccharides, these disaccharides basically hinders the transition movement, the uh, facilitated diffusion of the uh, glucose transporters as a result the transport becomes very slow the transport specificity becomes very slow so the glute transporter has become an for this this uh, knowledge which we gained from this structure can be utilized to design drug against this glute transporter because the glute 1 transporter is also an attractive target to block glucose uptake in malignant cells so if you design any inhibitor which can slow down the uptake or it inhibit the function of the glute, then we can kill the malignant cells. Hence using the structural information, we can screen for inhibitors which are longer, which can block the transport. either it can be a sugar inhibitors or it can be a molecules which are hydrophobic, which can recognize the particular tryptophan 386 which we see in the structural complex of GLUT3 with uh, uh, glucose transporter and maltose transporter so it can block the C terminal transition to transport glucose diffusion across the membrane bilayer. So from these complexes we, it reveals that the alternate axis transport mechanism which is very important for transporting the uh, glucose across the biological membranes. So to understand students to understand the mechanism I will I'd suggest you to was the animation video in the supplementary section in this articles which was published in nature. So go through that supplementary section, see the animation video, see understand how the transition happens when the sugar binds to the uh, glucose load transmitter, how it transports from the inward conformation to the outward open conformation. Inward conformation means it opens towards the cytoplasm outward conformation means it is open towards the periplasm. So when the sugar is there in the cytoplasm in the inward open conformation, the sugar comes and binds to the cavity. This binding of this sugar induces a conformational change in the transporter. As a result, the sugar get transported towards the periplasm. This is called as the 
diffusion mechanism in case of glute transporters. I will suggest you to go and watch the video of in the supplementary section in the article and understand the glucose transporter mechanism for the glute transporters. Here we see the maltose transporter ABC binding domain with ATP. So ABC family proteins bind ATP upon ATP hydrolysis use the energy to drive the transport of various molecules across the plasma membrane as well as across the intracellular membrane. So this ATP binding proteins or ABC family proteins they consist of multi subunit unit. One is the ATP binding cassette associated with two nucleotide binding domains as a cytoplasmic portion and two transmembrane domains to translocate substrate or essential nutrients across the membrane. On the right side you see a cartoon representation of a nucleotide binding domain from maltose transporter. So here on the left side you see a one monomer which is in green color. On the right side you see one monomer with cyan color. So in the center you see sphere representation there are two ATP molecules. So here the ATP molecules are helping in dimerization of this nucleotide binding domains. When these two nucleotide binding domain dimerize they open the transmembrane helices. So when they open the transmembrane helices the, the substrates like here in case of maltose transporter the maltose gets inside the transmembrane helices. When the hydrolysis happen at this nucleotide binding domain they again move away further away. With the movement of this nucleotide binding domain makes the transmembrane domain to close as a result the maltose gets transported across the transmembrane. As we see there you have a dimer of ATP in case of maltose transporter. So nucleotide binding domain as I said earlier dimerized when they bind ATP. It is also referred as closed dimer. So the complete ATP binding site is formed when nucleotide binding domain dimerize in case of ABC family proteins. So in general two ATP molecules get sandwiched between the conserved Walker A motif of one monomer. Walker A motif has a sequence patterns like G, X, 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 X followed by G or K followed by T or K and X can be any amino acids. So Walker A motif from one monomer and ABC signature motif which is nothing but a sequence L S G G motif. So for other monomer they help them to dimerize. So in this figure on the left side you see a monomer of a nucleotide binding domain where you see ABC domain which is in green color regulatory domain which is on the cyan color. So this ABC domain has a two domains one is the alpha helical domain and other is called rec -A domain. So rec -A domain is the domain where the ATP comes and binds. So on the right side you see a zoomed image of the ATP bound to both bind to the dimer. So here you see the Walker A motif which is shown in by the arrow. So it has a it has a G X X X X G slash K motif. So you see the beta phosphate of the ATP bound at the dipole helix. On the right side you see the LSGGQ signature motif coming from other monomer. This LSGGQ signature motif creates an, a motif which is followed by a helix loop helix motif that is the 310 loop is formed by because of this particular LSGGQ. So this provides a interactions to stabilize the ATP. Apart from that you see a tryptophan on the left side which is shown in green. So this tryptophan provides a stacking interaction with the adenine group of the ATP. So this places the adenine group very stable until the hydrolysis happens. Once the hydrolysis happens the gamma phosphate get released and as a result the dimerase the dimer opens up which results in opening of the 
transmembrane to transport the maltose across the membrane. Enzyme with ATP binding domain, Mori ligase with ADP slash substrate, UDPN acetyl miramyl l ala d -glo. Most of the Mori ligases are ATP dependent. ATP dependent Mori E is an essential enzyme for the synthesis of cell wall peptidoglycan in bacteria. Mori ligase folds into three domain, N terminal domain which is shown in red on the right side, ATPS domain or ATP binding domain which is shown in yellow on the right side, C domain or catalytic domain which is shown in violet on the right side. So it binds to the UDP N acetyl miramyl L ala D glue which is shown as a stick on the right side and it adds the mesodiamino pimelic acid in case of gram negative bacteria or lysine in case of gram positive bacteria. So when ATP binds to this ATPS domain after hydrolysis the catalytic domain comes closer to this of substrate then that mesodiamino pimelic acid added as a tripeptide is added as a third peptide to this substrate or it is a lysine in case of gram positive bacteria. Muri ligase can differentiate UDP and ATP. So ATP binds to the ATP binding domain whereas the UDP substrate binds only at the N terminal domain. So as we observed in N terminal binding domain of ABC family protein in previous section, Muri ligase also has a typical ATP binding motif where ATP binds but it is not involved in dimerization whereas it is involved in domain movement. Upon hydrolysis, the energy released from the ATP is utilized for domain movement in case of Mori ligase. So in the ATP binding protein examples, we saw two examples. One is the maltotransporter nucleotide binding domain where ATP binds and it dimerizes. So a second example is Mori ligase where it uses the ATP to bring the catalytic domain closer to the top ATP domain so that the third amino acid like DM, DAP or lysine can be added to the pentapeptide peptidoglycan. So to conclude ATP or GTP binding requires Wakare motif that is nothing but a P loop or phosphate loop where the beta phosphate goes and binds to the beta phosphate of ATP binds with a sequence pattern uh, binds to the nucleotide binding domain. And this phosphate loop has a sequence pattern called G, X, 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 G, it can be glycine or a lysine, followed by T, threonine or lysine. So it can be any amino acid residues which can follow this pattern. This motif is formed at the start of the dipole helix, which is very important for the beta phosphate to bind to the beta phosphate of the nucleotide, bind strongly to the nucleotide binding domain. Once this ATP binds strongly to the nucleotide binding domain. In case of maltose transporter nucleotide binding domain, they induce a dimerization in the nucleotide binding domain. Whereas in case of Mori ligase, this binding of ATP brings the catalytic domain closer to that of the ATPS domain so that the third amino acids can be added to the pentapeptide. For the nucleotide binding, there were another important future is that stacking. For nucleotide stacking, aromatic amino acids like tryptophan, phenylalanine, tyrosine is always observed in the ATP binding region. So depending upon the protein, the after ATP hydrolysis, the hydrolysis energy will be released, energy will be released by ATP hydrolysis will be utilized for conformational change or catalytic reaction. In case of maltotransporter, it is required for a conformational change which will open up the transmembrane region in case of maltose transporter. Whereas in case of Mori ligase, that ATP hydrolysis of the ATP is used to bring the catalytic domain closer to the tough ATPS domain so that there is additional peptide like pimelic acid or lysine can be added to the tripeptide UDP miramyl acetyl miramyl tripeptide. Signaling in neurons is controlled by serotonin receptors.
the major function of the serotonin receptor is to translocate the serotonin from the synaptic cleft back into the presynaptic terminal due to this slc6 that is means solute carrier 6 neurotransmitter a4 polymorphism there's a change in the rate of serotonin uptake which leads to the aggressive behavior of patients having alzheimer disease and post-traumatic stress disorder hence antidepressants are prescribed to these patients these drugs are also called as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors ssris as they bind directly to the serotonin transporters but the problem here is that with these drugs as these drugs also binds to other homologous receptors like nor epipharine and dopamine transporters there is no crystal structure so far for the serotonin receptors but there is a homolog of serotonin receptor which is lut transporter which is called as a serotonin homolog which is shown on on the right side figure so you have the serotonin receptor lut transporter with a leucine substrate bound at the cavity of the lut transporter lut is an homolog for human sodium symporter family lut transporter from aquifex aliocus shares 20 to 25% sequence identity with human serotonin transporter nor epipharine and dopamine transporter members of sodium symporter family the crystal structure of lute which is shown on the right side in violet color it transports mechanism is considered as a good model system for the study of mammalian nss family proteins so on the right side you see the cartoon representation of lute transporter with the leucine bound at the center of the cavity which is shown in ball and stick here we see crystal complex made by the group with different amino acid substrate which acts as inhibitor so we have four structures here leucine complex with the lutein transporter tryptophan complex with the leucine transporter alanine complex with the leucine transporter and ppf which is an inhibitor of leucine transporter on the right side you see the cup cartoon representation of loot transporter with the leucine bound at the substrate this is the same position where this all this amino acids binds here very important region is that you have a carboxyl group in each amino acids this carboxyl group is neutralized by the sodium which is shown in blue color in case of in all these substrate complexes that drug serotonin binds to the extracellular visible region in lut this region is close to the halogen binding site in lut transporter the drug binds to the extracellular side inhibits the movement of transmembrane helices which is shown on the arrow you see the serotonin bind at the extracellular visible region the drug forms an halogen binding packet and blocks the lut transport the drug has a chlorine ion as an halogen which binds to this halogen binding site and prevents the movement of this helices the fluxatine binds to the extracellular visible region in lute which is shown in yellow on the left side which is a bound to the extracellular visible region on the right side you see that zoomed image of that binding of fluxatine to the lute this region is also close to the halogen binding site which observed in serotonin line also the drug binds to the extracellular site and inhibits the movement of transmembrane helices the drug form halogen binding packet similar to that of serotonin line blocks the lute transport this fluxocytin has a fluoride as a halogen both serotonin line and fluoxetin binds to the same extracellular visible region in lute binding of drug to the extracellular site inhibit the movement of transmembrane helices drug specificity is majorly depends on the halogen group forming a halogen binding pocket biochemically and physiologically it was observed 
this antidepressant binds to other norepinephrine and dopamine receptor enzyme antibiotic drug complex dna gyrase cunulo dna gyrase is a type 2 topoisomerase functionally it forms heterotetramer a2 b2 gyrase a gyrase b which is shown on the right side the primary function on dna gyrase is to introduce negative supercoil during dna replication process basically it cleaves the double stranded dna which is shown on the figure at one end and pass through other strand thereby introducing negative supercoil cunulon known antibiotics used as an inhibitor against dna gyrase ciprofloxacin which is in gray stacks with dna which is in orange color interacts with the serine 83 which is shown in yellow on the left side thereby inhibit the supercoil process during dna replication the cunulon drug inhibition depends on the magnesium ion concentration which is required for the effective inhibition of topoisomerase fluoroquinolones antibiotics was used for the treatment of enteric fever which basically targets dna gyrase as we observe from the complex how it inhibits on the left side you see a wild type where the fluoroquinolone antibiotics interacts with serine 83 on the right side due to the mutation of aspartic acid 87 it gets uncoiled which is shown in cyan color so it loses the interaction with the antibiotics so the bacterial passengers has gained resistance by introducing simple mutation at the cunulon binding site like serine 83 to phenylalanine thiase to tyrosine or aspartic acid 87 to glycine as shown in the figure which drastically reduce the affinity of these drugs as a result the organism gains resistance lock and key hypothesis in 1894 herman ml lewis fisher put an hypothesis that a substrate and an exam have specific geometry shape that fits exactly into each other having a natural geometry called as lock and key hypothesis it was assumed to be applicable to all protein substrates so in the figure you see that there is a shape which is designed for the substrate which is shown as yes so the substrate basically goes and binds exactly to the shape that is the lock and key hypothesis proposed by Herman. the lock and key hypothesis basically failed in some cases so there is an another hypothesis which was proposed which is called induced fit hypothesis in actual biological scenario enzyme change their shape slightly to match the substrate hence another scientist named daniel koshland slightly modified the lock and key hypothesis to induce fit hypothesis the hypothesis says that the enzymes are flexible the active site is constantly being reshaped by the interaction with the substrate so students let us summarize what we have learned in this model in this model we have seen some examples with lock and key hypothesis and induced type of ligand protein complexes for example lock and key hypothesis we have paler to where the lipid comes and binds and it gets hydrolyzed into certain eicosanoids in case of induced fit hypothesis we have seen that in loot transporter we have leucine binds to the transporter which induce a conformational change in the leucine transporter we have also seen in the glucose transporter where the glucose comes and binds it induces a conformational change so that it gets transported across the membrane we have also seen uh, example for the LUT along with the drug complexes so these are induced fit type of ligand protein complexes we have seen that this hypothesis this induced fit the what you call lock and key hypothesis also fails in case of some cases like receptor drug complexes where you see we observe that the drug can bind and tightly and it will inhibit the function of the protein but it is binding as a different extracellular region so their lock and key hypothesis fails with examples used for drug receptor complex or enzyme complex you have learned that how drug can be designed to bind to specific cavity or a binding site for example in 
in paleo 2 we have seen that the drug aspirin binds only at a certain portions but it does not cover the hydrophobic channel for example in case of complex of paleo 2 there is a scope which which will improve the drug design like you can design more hydrophobic uh, inhibitor which can block the hydrophobic channel and also it specifically bind to the active site amino acids to become more specific to a particular target but the lesson learned here is that biochemically we can find any drug interacting with the target molecules you can screen thousands and thousands of compounds to bind to the molecule but actual atomic detail will help us to improve the specificity and also avoid the promiscuous drug which leads to the side effect in in case of human